There we go. I'm going to talk about the booming home construction industry and how local government is working within the FWC regulations to protect our gopher tortoises. And at the a little bit later on, I am going to talk about scrub jays and our protected plants as well. Um, but let's get right into it because I've got a lot of slides. And if you miss anything on these, because I talk fast as a New Yorker, hopefully you'll be able to catch up on the recording. End, and I apologize in advance. Oh, I'm Jennifer, sure you your, your slides aren't there now. I oh. see the city, the city page. Oh, yes, that is a slide. Is that right? Oh, it is that. And this is actually an old screenshot of the city page. Uh, just to show you where the Habitat Sightings app is, it is still there, but this blue bar is now white on the new Northport page. Um, so as you can see, you have to go to the uh, public works, the government section, public works, and then there's a Habitat Sightings app. As you see the gopher tortoises basking in their burrows right along the roads and the swales, you can report these. Uh, the burrows are not visible to us as we report them. They have a fear that that would leave the tortoises vulnerable, but they do have those. And I'm working with uh, their GIS guy to try to make an ArcGIS layer available for people that need this information. Um, so we'll leave the city behind. The, one of the most common questions I'm asked is, you know, the lot next door is for sale or it just sold and there's gopher tortoises on it. What happens to them? How does this whole thing work? The good news is that the city does a site visit in addition to utilizing that computer database of information to identify natural resources, including the gopher tortoises, the scrub jays, eagle nests, wetland, uh, the big trees that are now have better layers of protection. If they find anything at all, the permit is not released until the documentation is provided to show the burrows are being avoided or they're relocated or the trees are mitigated. There's a, there's a whole list of natural resources on the checklist. Jeremy Rogus is currently doing all of those walkthroughs and he actually did the FWC gopher tortoise training. So the good news is he knows what he's looking for. The sellers cannot move the tortoises as part of their condition of sale or they can't be relocated so we can mulch. It just doesn't happen. Uh, the FWC has a checks and balances system set in with the local governments. They may issue the permit when a site plan is provided to them and they receive the application, but we can't execute that permit without local government approval that requires a local building permit, construction permit, that shows that the tortoises can't be avoided. So there is a checks and balances between the FWC and the local government. Um, and that's why we can't just move the tortoises out of the way when somebody wants to sell or buy a parcel. The other question that I get a lot of is that there are tortoises everywhere, so how can they possibly be endangered? It's not the tortoises that are currently endangered, and we want to keep it that way. It's the habitat that's in danger. And that is harder to manage because we can't tell people what they can and can't do on their parcels. So we're trying, we the state of Florida and those of us that work in this are trying really hard to keep the animals from becoming endangered. And the work that's being done has been enough to show the federal government that it, they don't need federal endangered species protection. The FWC is managing it probably better than it would be if it were turned over to US fisheries and wildlife. The cost for tortoise relocations is going up constantly. The basic borough permit that covers 10 boroughs, and if we can do an on site relocation, is about $2,100 if I do it. I don't know what other consultants charge. But the recipient areas that take the tortoises, if we have to relocate them over near Okeechobee, they're charging $6,000 per animal relocated. Um, that's tough. And it goes up. If I've got 10 or 12 boroughs on a lot, it can easily be a $20,000 or a $40,000 relocation. 
the city or county, the city of Northport, they place a hold on the permit and they notify the owner or the builder and they contact someone, myself or others, to obtain the FWC permit. and do the relocation take longer than six months the uh, new church that's going in on Biscayne is uh, it's a six monther it's taking a very long time but we want to make sure that all of those little critters are taken care of and not impacted any more than necessary how do we move them I get in there with an excavator and that prompts a lot of calls to the FWC emergency line the <laughs> everybody shows up. The FWC law enforcement shows up. Sometimes it's the sheriff or the local PD because I'm, I'm showing up on a lot with no permit issued on it that, that's available through the county or the city website and I start digging. I have the FWC permit. It is posted on site, um, but it, it does cause panic and I understand why. We do have to excavate every borough all the way to the very end. Um, that's where the excavator does not actually dig up the tortoises. It scrapes about four to six inches of soil away. And then we hand dig the burrow that we have a PVC pipe in so we don't lose where that burrow is. And as you can see in the picture, there's a little you know, half moon shaped hole there that we keep open with a hand shovel and we just scrape the surface away with the excavator. So no need for the panic that we, that we see a lot. Um, I do find other animals in the burrows, everything from rat snakes and timber rattlers to possums. I've got a picture of me holding an armadillo. We had a, an iguana come out at 100 miles an hour and scare the bejesus out of everybody. Um, possums, it turns out, growl. And I had a very pregnant possum come running out of a burrow when I poked her with the PVC. So we, we try to make sure that everybody is out of harm's way before the builders go in and pour concrete on their heads. If you buy a house or a lot with a tortoise burrow in it, um, or you want to sell one, you have to remember that it shouldn't be a big deal. It's not legal to harass them or throw, put things in the burrow mouth or chase them away so they don't come back. That, that's considered harassment and it's a felony. Um, and that's probably the hardest part of educating the public is they've decided that the animal is a problem and they're worried about their sidewalk or their pool deck collapsing. So I do a lot of explaining. The burrow is the same size as the bottom at the top. We're not creating a sinkhole. Um, and they make better neighbors than most people. They're quiet. They don't eat much. They're cute. They bask in the sun. The picture here was in my front yard in my house in Englewood. This is what got me into this business. And as you can see, there's a big fresh apron of sand and she's sitting there looking all happy basking in the sun. This is about three years later. You see that the grass has grown up. I put in the split rail fence to keep my mower with the zero turn mower that he runs over it, um, keeps him away from it. He has to trim it with weed eater. They can incorporate into a yard, front yard, backyard, side yard with no problem at all. So we just have to work on telling people that it's okay that they're there. The sod forms a nice protective layer over the top that helps keep the burrow from collapsing. They like to come out and nibble and bask. So the less distance they have to go to keep them out of that road, the better. Um, so a lot of times we, we do a lot of PR work just to let people know that the, the little guys are nothing to be afraid of. Um, here's the back of the house, a different tortoise had dug under my air conditioner support created a little trough for herself. She hit the pool equipment right there behind it on that slab and made a hard right. No big deal. She moved out on her own a couple of months later when we hit rainy season and my eaves were dripping right in there and flooding that burrow. So you just let them be them and they take care of themselves. If you see a problem, use the FWC hotline. The lady or the gentleman that answers the phone and routes those calls is an FWC officer. So you're not talking to a random answering service. You can give them information. They will send someone out as soon as they can. Move the tortoises off the road. Yes, you're not supposed to touch them. Don't ever put them in your car to take them to a safer location. That will get you in trouble. 
but take them across the road in the direction they're going. I'm sure you already know this. Don't be afraid to share that as our people are down here from up north for the winter time. We, it, it's a public education campaign that we're in the middle of every year when we get our snowbirds to come down. Um, so, you know, don't let anybody panic and they're afraid to touch it. They don't bite. Uh, do wash your hands in case there's a salmonella issue going on, but no problem. Uh, remember that dogs off leash are probably the biggest contributor to the tortoises ending up in the wildlife hotline or in the wildlife rehab center due to damage to their hind legs. The dogs will try to pull them out of their burrows. So the little terriers that were bred for that overseas, they are probably a bigger risk to your tortoises than your average Labrador that's going to slob slobber all over it. I know how frustrating it is and how stressful it is to watch lots just get cleared to sand and 50 loads of sand come in. We can't fix the development, but what we have to do is find a way to take control and contribute something. And that's why we're all here. That's why you're watching. It's why I do what I do. We can all create native habitats in a small section to create little habitat corridors and stepping stones. <clears throat> These four houses right in a row, imagine what this would look like if there were a 10 foot strip of native vegetation separating the two yards from each other and providing forage back there instead of this essential wasteland. This house that they're backing up to has a big oak tree, but that's not tortoise habitat. That's not scrub jay habitat. That doesn't do anything for the pollinators. A little 10 foot wide scrub garden all the way down behind all four of these houses would be fantastic. And we put together what that would look like along with a list of plants with a little lump in the middle. This is only half, so you'd have to flip this mirror image it to get this uh, scrub garden of native plants. Any configuration is possible. Um, I did this with a recipient area size in mind of 10 feet wide. <clears throat> but we could do oval, we could do kidney bean, we could do a quarter circle in a back corner of your yard around a planting that you've got. And the FWC will reward you for doing that. If you put in medium to high forage value plants in a little tortoise garden or a scrub garden, because it'll serve the jays, it'll serve the pollinators, they will give you a sign that lets everybody come by know what you're doing. It's free. The um, There's a link to the Southwest plants that are everything from unblooming green palmetto down to, I'm gonna go back to that one, down to flowering plants. If you wanted a nice little butterfly garden in the backyard, it does both. The beggar ticks, they are high forage value for the tortoises. They're great for the birds. They're great for the pollinators. So it is really it's a win-win situation for everybody. And this is part of getting the word out that we can all do and kind of advertise it uh, because people like things like this. It's a, it's a feel good and warm fuzzies thing. And the more people we can get doing that, the better off we are. We do have more than tortoises here, however. Scrub jays are a big deal. This cute little guy was uh, over in the Western end of North Park or of North Fort. Um, their territories are fairly small. And this is another area where you can make a big impact in your yard, even if you're not in an active family territory. The birds could take advantage of your yard as a stepping stone of habitat when they're either moving to another area like Harbor Heights or Deep Creek or leaving their birth territory and family territory to settle their own. Now, this is the current Northport map from the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife with the year that the uh, territories were added. Um, in 2021, actually starting in 2018, a group of us got together to determine if those 2006 territories were still active because there was some argument from the builders that it was all old and out of date. Um, and what we found is that those territories have shifted a little bit and we've gained a new one. The green one over there on DeLong is brand new. But this is where we found the Jays. Uh, the yellow circles represent 850 feet, actually all of the circles, away from the siding. That is the estimated territory. Now we know we did not get that sighting right in the middle of their habitat or in their family territory. So it's a starting point and we do multiple surveys to see just how much room is covered. 
um, and you see the circles on the map, it's because they started with a sighting. Uh, this March, when we get back out there, we not only want to continue on that northwest area, but there's this little area down to the southeast that is starting to see a lot of development. And I don't know if those birds are there. So I'm going to be out there looking to see if we can find them. And that little shaded area of two territories adjoined or two sightings may have been somebody just moving from one territory to the next, or that might be a home territory. So hopefully we'll have some updates on that. And again, what can you do in your yard? Plant the small trees. We've seen just how much of a problem the canopy trees can be in the recent storms. And unfortunately, it's got us back on our heels because now everybody wants to cut down all the darn trees again. Um, but this would be a good response to that. Put in a native plant, a native scrub garden with a short oak that doesn't get any bigger than the 10 or 20 feet tall. Uh, keep an area with native plants and exposed sand so the little birds can cache their acorns and encourage everybody to keep the cats indoors. The scrub jays do spend a lot of time on the ground and that makes them vulnerable to cats outside, unfortunately. Uh, this one in the photo is over in Charlotte County but he's eating a seed that he obviously had picked up out of a neighbor's bird feeder. So they do go to bird feeders and he flew off into the pepper to nibble on it. You know, no problem. He wasn't at all camera shy. There's no zoom on that. I just leaned down and took the picture of him. As far as our plants go, we know that we've got extra protections on all of the trees bigger than 12 inches now. Um, I've heard a lot of people say that that's just a money grab, but that mitigation fund stays in Northport and they aren't spending it on anything. It's not going to get reappropriated to somebody's pet project. Uh, they are taking some suggestions from some of the environmental advisory boards and other groups about what to do with that money. Um, but for now it is sitting there and growing and the goal is to use it in Northport to improve our habitat on public lands so that we can put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. Scrub, scrub oaks are important, native plants are important, pollinator gardens, all of that is a big deal. Um, so in addition to planting, you wanna make sure that all of the natives are, uh, invasives are removed and replaced with native species so that the pepper doesn't just keep growing back. Um, we do have 448 plant species that are protected in Florida. So we all know about mangroves, we know about the big trees, we We might have one or two that we're familiar with. There is a spreadsheet that gets updated every couple of years um, and it's full of great information. And that's the kind of stuff that I look for when I am out doing parcel evaluations. So this particular slide is uh, Donna. And I found all of these Tillandsia utriculatas, big air ferns on the ground, most of them, you can see that they're three, four feet across. These are huge air plants underneath an oak hammock. Uh, some were on vines, some were on dead wood that was on the ground, some were on the ground themselves. Uh, if they remind you of pineapples, that's because it's the same family. Um, I was able to get a permit for free to relocate these. Donna and Ernie came out to help dig them all up and they took them back to wherever it is their home site is. Uh, to make sure that there were no weevils that will attack and kill these that could be spread to other Tillandsia. And then they were relocated to appropriate habitat so they didn't get bulldozed under, which is what would have happened to them if we left them here. And I left the Walker Homes image in here because they were very cooperative about that when I called them. Um, I was there looking for mainly gopher tortoise burrows, but whatever I find, including a couple of heritage oaks on this parcel, and this group of protected plants, they were very accommodating. So they've, they've had some bad rep with scrub jay stuff in the past, but I think they have got their act together now. At least, at least I don't have any trouble working with them. So I blew through those in a slide a minute. So thank you all for putting up with that. And I would like to open the floor up because I know there are gonna be questions and I didn't want to spend an hour and three minutes on a slide and then have you guys not be able to 
address why you're here. So. Okay, so we are ready for questions. And yeah, you did you um, turn off screen share? Yeah, okay. So hold on and if you can either type a question in the chat or if you would like to um, just unmute yourself and ask your question and you can certainly do that as well. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a couple of questions. How successful uh, is it to relocate the gopher tortoises? I prefer on-site relocations because the tortoises know where home is. They have that same homing device that the sea turtles have. So when we relocate them to the recipient areas in Okeechobee, they are fenced in yeah. to keep them from just heading back towards the coast, but it does stress them out. Uh, the, the going argument that I'm not really happy with is that uh, a 60% survival rate is better than zero because they get buried under concrete. I think we can do better than that. And I think we need to do better than that. So the failure to thrive, the stress levels, the fact that they're thrown in with tortoises with different circadian rhythms than they have, even though there are supposed to be limits on how they can move, um, it, it's not unsuccessful, but it's not as successful as it should be. The on-site relocations, it does leave the tortoises in their home territory and, you know, the neighbors that have them named and keep an eye on them are happy, but that puts them at risk of more street crossings. They're forced into urbanization. They're not on, you know, 20,000 acres of a cattle farm to wander around. They are kept in our urban neighborhoods. And, you know, the tortoises that I see don't seem stressed or unhappy. I never find them with respiratory illnesses. Um, I don't find them missing legs. I mean, they seem to urbanize really well. So if you ask me a personal opinion, I think keeping them in their home territory is much better. And I think the FWC needs to do better on the offsite relocations to improve their survival rate. What, what can we do uh, to help that? Putting in those, uh, the, the tortoise gardens that right. give them forage in your backyard to keep them away from roads. Um, there's a reason why we have to avoid the burrows by 25 feet. And that's because they spend a lot of time within 25 feet of their burrow. Um, they will come out to forage, they'll come out to bask, and they will only really wander when they either need forage that they can't get to or they need to mate. Um, sometimes a burrow will get flooded and they'll head off to another burrow down the street, but by providing food in their home territory, it'll keep them there and keep them out of the roads. Yeah, um, one more question. I, I think I read that they took gopher tortoises off the endangered species list. How does that no. affect? They, the tortoises that were on the endangered species list are in the federal endangered species list are still there and that is in some parts of Georgia. The, we were on the waiting list or on the voting list or on the agenda, however you want to look at it, to see if they needed to be added in Florida. Um, and due to the way that we've seen the scrub jays be handled by the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife, where they have essentially written off small populations as non-viable, and mm. the permitting can take a year, and the mitigation can be $18,000 on a quarter acre lot in Northport. Oh, uh, we don't want the federal government to take over gopher tortoises. It will just re result in more of them being dead. Right. So, so, <laughs> so they did not, the, the federal government agreed that the FWC is managing it appropriately and probably better than they, than the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife could dedicate the resources to it. Uh, the plans from the FWC were, if it passed, to uh, work with the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife to continue the tortoise protection program that they already have. So it really, nothing changed for us at all by it, them not going on the federal list here. Okay, all right, okay, good, thank you. 
I saw a question come up in chat about Charlotte County. It is exactly the same. Uh, Charlotte County does, they actually have three people that go out and walk 100% of the lots and they will flag burrows. Uh, they're pretty good at identifying what's a tortoise burrow and what isn't. If there's any question at all, they flag it and leave it up to other people. So they uh, they check every lot, they flag them, and they'll, they'll call in a, a consultant or an expert when they need to to relocate them. And they will not release the permit until they have an after action report that says the, those tortoises have been moved. All right. All right. Okay. I, ha I have a question. Um, what remind me, FWC says one tortoise needs how much land? <laughs> that that's a loaded question um for Sorry. the recipient areas they will only allow so don't get in your mind this they're charging six thousand dollars a tortoise i'm going to go buy 40 acres and make a million dollars they consider a fully stocking an ideal habitat four tortoises per acre you can't buy acreage that cheap anymore to make that worthwhile you can't charge enough per tortoise to make that a viable investment is that realistic? No, I've got 17 burrows on a quarter acre lot. They are looking long-term because these parcels go into forever in perpetuity trusts as protected. So that the, the ranchers, grandsons can't sell it off to meal communities and have a development there. So they're looking at final stock, stocking rates after successful and protected breeding. Um, so that's the that's why you'll see four per acre on an ideal situation on recipient areas. For an on-site recipient area, it's 750 square feet with no area smaller than 10. That's why I've got that 10 by 75 area along the back of every parcel to do a recipient area on. In reality, it depends on the quality of the habitat that they're in. If the habitat is great and there's a lot of food, It'll support a lot of tortoises with no problem. Okay, thank you, because I do get a little confused on that. I have one more question about habitat. So um, some of the conservancy lots and some other ones that we're currently looking at, uh, that we went and looked at over the weekend, are thick with saw palmetto. I mean thick, and there's three lots in a row. There are five burrows total, one on one lot, two on the middle lot, two on the end lot, very thick saw palmetto. They found a way to dig their burrows in between mm -hmm. the, you know, how the, like the saw palmetto will lay on the ground and such. Yep. Not your typical sandy, what the textbook says mm -hmm. it should be. So, I mean, it seems to me in my observations, just for the couple of years I've been doing this, is that where there's a will, there's a way. And this is where they've chosen to dig their home. And they're not cruising blocks of land to look for this perfect textbook yep. habitat so when not. it comes to when it comes to like the on-site relocation and the choice of habitat is there concession made for what they're already living in or is it no this is what they have to have and it doesn't matter that they've lived here for 50 years in the salt palmetto lot we're going to tell you you have to have this for on-site relocation i have a fear that with the new permitting guideline um amendments that are coming i haven't read through them yet and the public comment period is coming up. Uh, they are tightening up their restrictions on on sites um, and they will be looking closer at habitat. Up to this point, I have a pretty good relationship with the FWC and I can plead my case on it. And always when I prepare my recipient area exhibits, I take photos of the current borough locations. And if it's tucked under soft palmetto, I will point out that the recipient area habitat is exactly the same as where the burrows are. Sometimes okay. that's not the case. When the right. burrows are out in the swale and it's grassy and the back of the lot is that thick saw palmetto, I can't say that and I don't say that because it's right. not accurate. Right. So in those cases, we could improve that habitat in the back. We could, or if it's caught early enough, clear that back 10 feet as long as there's no burrows impacted, it could be cleared, brought up to the grade that it needs to be on the site plan for drainage so that it passes, replant the proper high forage, high medium forage, put in a pretty landscaped garden, 
Um, it's expensive, but my argument is that for the price of offsite relocation, the builder and the homeowner are going to save money by putting in a 750 square foot landscape area over moving one tortoise to Okeechobee. So it's both. The, the habitat is not ideal. They will live. Tortoise habitat is where tortoises live. Right. Uh, I guess that's the thing. Then. The, it is. And as they're squeezed in the less and less favorable habitat, we're going to run into this more. And I, like I said, I know the FWC is going to crack down on it. I'm hoping they will take current habitat or current living arrangements into account, but I don't know. I just yeah. don't know. Hoping, I mean, all, all we can do, I guess, is hope and make our comments and give our input. When we're observing them living in non-textbook habitat every day, maybe there needs to be some changes in what's considered, you know, textbook habitat. So, well, all right, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll let someone else have there, a turn. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there are. I, and yes, I will uh, share that list of the endangered and threatened plants for the state of Florida. I'll pull that link up and uh, I'll post it so that y'all can have access to it. Um, and I did try on my end, but I'm 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 the one with the recording button, and it doesn't let me do anything. So right, okay. That, so, yeah. um, Renee had a second part to her question in in Charlotte County, and it's actually one that uh, Barbara and I were talking about before we went live. Big developments being required to leave green space to prevent the fragmentation. It has been my wish list to have developers put in that 10 foot greenway along the back. It would actually be a 20 foot wide wildlife corridor and people would be living on a lot that's 80 by 115 instead of 80 by 125. Um, the challenge is getting to the development people early enough. That would have to be brought up in one of the initial city planning meetings. And by the time it gets to us in the public comment, it's way too late. So we're absolutely right. It needs to happen ahead of time. It has to be something that comes from the comp plan in the city and the county. Um, and I believe there are opportunities to do that. It's just a matter of time and persistence. And unfortunately, Barbara and I both work full time plus um, and we can't do it all, but we are, we're trying. And we certainly have a, a good support people that, that want to make this happen. Um, Hi, Edie, how you doing? She may have bugged out. Um, Edie's asking about the 25 foot buffer, but the fact that there are burrows on adjacent parcels. Uh, the reality of that is we can't dig up or relocate a tortoise that's on the neighboring parcel. It's not ours, we don't have the rights to it. Uh, it's trespassing and we certainly can't take a, a backhoe or a shovel to it to relocate a tortoise. So in those cases, when that gopher tortoise burrow is within X number of feet of the property line, if it's more than eight or 10 feet inside that parcel, it probably won't be found during the uh, inspection. I mean, I walk the property lines maybe a little bit out and so do the city and county folks. If it's further inside than that, then it won't be impacted by clearing that lot line. If it is close within that eight or 10 feet and we see it, we are very careful to put in um, some protection. Even if we don't have to relocate a tortoise from the target parcel, we have to make sure that the one on the adjacent parcel is not impacted. And usually that's done with silt fencing and signage. Uh, there is still no foolproof way to keep people, subcontractors, whether it's the seawall folks or the, the concrete pumping truck, uh, the septic guys are the absolute worst about it. They just cut diagonally across the vacant lot to get to the back of the house that they're working on. And they don't notice the burrows, whether it's ignorance or, or willful destruction, we don't know and we can't prove that. Um, so we try to keep an eye out for them and, and mark them. And that's the other reason to note the burrows that you see and mark them with signs or call one of us to do it so that that doesn't happen accidentally. Hi, Jennifer. Hey. <laughs> okay. There's a second question there about. And this is probably the heart of why everybody that we speak to at the FWC does not like on site relocations. Builders are non compliant, um, almost to the point of being willfully non compliant. 
They don't keep the silt fence up. They have no respect for that recipient area. Um, and as far as the FWC is concerned, they are they would be perfectly content if on-site relocations went away. And the tortoises, again, they it might only be a 60% survival rate, but it's better than leaving them at the mercy of the builders who have no respect for them at all. Uh, I don't like the answer, but that's it is what it is. So we, I, I'm, they're not all bad. I have some very good builders. They will call me instantly, whether that's because of fear of the repercussions, I, I don't care. Uh, whatever makes them make that phone call and do the right thing is great. Um, but the, the on sites, I need active neighbors keeping an eye on them and the homeowners to put pressure on the builders to say, hey, it's a critter, it's a life, you know, show a little bit of respect for it. Um, if you do witness something, it, everybody's got a camera, get that phone out, take lots of pictures, get license plates. Um, even if it's in your, in your hand and you're not visibly videoing them, you're at least getting sound. And then you, know, you make sure, hey, there's a gopher tortoise burrow there. You need to stay 25 feet away from it. You just provide facts without being confrontational and getting into an argument with them. And you've got their response recorded and you call the FWC and you report it. It is very difficult to get things persecuted properly and make those felonies stick. Um, the way the rules are written, there is no gray area so that it gives the FWC the best chance to get a prosecution successfully done. Uh, the borough is protected as well as the tortoise. So fiddling with the boroughs, pouring bleach down them, stuffing it with leaves or cabbage palmetto fronds, all of that stuff is not allowed. Um, and if it's proven to be willful and you've got the photos to, to back it up, we, it will get prosecuted. The FWC officers that respond, uh, they get very frustrated just on principle. They may not know all of the gopher tortoise guidelines, but they're law enforcement officers and they, they don't like to see people getting away with stuff just because they can. Okay, I have another question. So what about, and I get this question a lot, uh, a, a resident will call me and say, oh my gosh, they're their survey stakes uh, at the gopher tortoise lot next to me. It's in my yard all the time. My yard is fenced. Um, you know, I've got some natural stuff in my backyard. Can't I just keep it here until construction is done and then we can let it go. And, and then that brings into like right now, um, we have a, a lot, the Conservancy owns a lot, and there's one for sale next door, and the Gopher Tortoise Burrow is very close to the line, mm -hmm. and I say to myself, well, how come I couldn't contact that person and say, hey, when you get ready to build, let us know, we've got perfect habitat right next door, we'll just still fence it off and keep the tortoise over here until you're done, but that's not allowed, like people that want to help cannot help, and with when right. you think about the fact that tortoises are living in neighborhoods where there are houses being built. For example, in my neighborhood, there's one vacant lot amongst about 15 houses. There's three, two or three burrows on it, two burrows on the lot, and then one in the neighbor's front yard. But if that lot gets built on, those tortoises probably could be relocated. But they, yep. they're living here just fine amongst the sod and the non-native plants and the native plants. So why? Why is there such an issue where people want to help and they can't? We're not allowed to fence them in we have to fence them out. Um, and that is the other reason that I prefer the on-site relocations because it exactly what you want to happen happens. They're excluded from that project area. The silt fence goes around that 80 by 115 lot. It's cleared inside, the house is built inside, the builders are supposed to close the front gate to keep the tortoises from coming in, they don't. Um, I just had to remove a, a tortoise from underneath the stem wall for a pool because the silt fence was down all the way around the house and she came in and dug. Um, so if the neighbors have these little tortoise gardens and the ideal forage and great habitat, and we get that garden put in on, your, on the con conservancy lots, then you're almost luring the tortoises into better habitat for them. 
they don't mind. After the after Ian, especially, I had tortoises that had their burrows flooded. They apparently decided, oh, I picked a bad spot to dig my burrow. I'm going to go 10 feet over here and dig a new one. Not understanding that that's probably not any different from flooding perspective, but they can dig a new burrow in three days. So if they suddenly find great habitat in your backyard or in the side lot, they will move away from the construction activities and into nicer habitat for them. Um, so you can't fence them in, but you can make it, you know, really so they don't want to leave. And you could even go so far as to, in those tortoise gardens or little scrub gardens, put a little berm of a spoil pile. And tortoises love spoil piles. So you put a starter burrow in right in the middle of all this food. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if they moved in. Um, and yes, David, you, <laughs> I've been talking to people about this all day. You can get a stop work order in most cases. Absolutely. The trouble is who do you call to get it done immediately? Whether it's somebody who's decided they're going to clear their lot over a weekend because it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Uh, code enforcement isn't working. Heaven knows that the Northport law enforcement group is, you know, stretched a little thin these days with the shenanigans going on. Um, so who do we call? FWC sometimes takes a little while to get there. Uh, sometimes they're there in a couple of hours, but other times it takes them a little longer. So I'm not sure how to get that stop work order done in some, in, in some cases. In other cases, absolutely, you get a temporary stop work order until the county can you know, look into it and those natural resources are protected and it, it can happen. It's just a matter of how to make it happen fast enough to protect the natural resources that are on that lot. Yeah, it's been a while since I looked at the FWC rules about what you can and cannot do interacting with a gopher tortoise. But if I remember correctly, there's absolutely nothing that prohibits you from fencing areas on your own property if gopher tortoises are within your property. So I'm not sure that that's 100% correct that you couldn't fence it on your property. On someone else's property, of course, you could never do that. But if you have a gopher tortoise that lives in your backyard and you put up a perimeter fence, if you're not putting it within 25 feet of its burrow, that's that's not prohibited. I, I don't think it's addressed specifically that way, but I bet if you were to ask somebody at the FWC, they would say you can't fence them in. Um, in reality, are they gonna come out and do that inspection for the, for the boroughs before they issue you a fence permit? No. Um, if you're not hurting the tortoise, is it really hurting anything? Only during mating season. Um, You know, I, I, it's, but they, they dig themselves under fences. And yes, Edie, I spoke with Jeremy today. The problem is that he doesn't work weekends. I did threaten to call his cell phone at nine o'clock on a Sunday morning, but he knew I was kidding. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, that's the, it, it's that open-ended question of who, who do we call? Uh, it apparently is not the new conservation officer that works for Northport. We still don't know what he does. Um, but, you know, I, I'm kind of with you. If I had an opportunity to put up a, a fence to at least prevent most shenanigans in my backyard, and the, I would try to find a way that the tortoise could squeeze in or in or out under that fence if he really wanted to go. But I would uh, certainly want to make sure that I had all the, all the munchies and nibblies and everything that could keep a tortoise happy in my yard. Um, that one in the front yard of my Englewood property She's been perfectly content there for five or six years, no problem at all. I was gonna say one challenge with, you know, somebody clearing a lot, builder clearing without the actual permit um, being issued, meaning they're clearing before potentially any surveys have been done for gulf tortoises or trees or whatever, is the reality of where that to my knowledge, one agent in Sarasota County is at any given time. So um, experience I had, I happened to get extremely lucky because the FWC agent was in Northport at the time that I called 
FWC. So the reality is you could call and that FWC agent can be out on Longboat Key or something. So, yep. you know, that's but, part of- And that takes longer. Other times they're there in half an hour. Absolutely. All right. Well, I feel, oh, sorry. Go oh, I, I was just responding to Edie again with a oh. non emergency contact. Um, oh, yeah. That, that's definitely the way to do it. It's not a 911 call. Um, so, really, the, the, the message uh, we've, we've said a couple of times in different ways, and it's, it's really, I think, something we have to seriously focus on as the future keeps unfolding here with development is we've got to start planting back putting things that actually belong, creating the space um, in an in, in effort to each person having some kind of native habitat in their yard to help, you know, provide for the wildlife and the biodiversity. It, it's, you know, the conservancy, obviously we have a mission to acquire full lots and, and you know, maintain the entire lot in perpetuity, but, you know, we're far behind the race of development and, and we're doing our best, but, it, there's so many yards out there that are just blank canvases to, yep. to plant things in, um, whether it's existing construction or new construction. So yeah, um, and I, Jennifer's been talking with the Florida Native Plant Nursery about rolling out some plant packages and things, and we're trying to get that together. Um, do you have any update on that, Jennifer, or no? Not yet. I don't. I still don't have a price list. Um, okay. I also have the call into my contact at Earth Balance because I didn't oh, get anywhere with their plant sales people. Okay. Um, so I need a backdoor in, so to speak, to try to get packages there. The, um, the other big boost for this movement would be working with the planning department, public works, and the, the project managers at Northport before they start putting in plantings anywhere to get them to do the native planting, combine the pollinator garden with a scrub oak and some bare sand and some native, um, the, the gover tortoise forage. So it covers all of our charismatic megafauna and then a whole bunch of other stuff we can't see. And as our new visitors and our new residents see this everywhere they go in public spaces and in people's yards with the signs, it doesn't take long for something like that to catch on and pick up, pick up some steam, so to speak, and it becomes normal. Um, but there, there are definite challenges with that. But that's where we want to go, and that uh, native plant or that, that uh, tree mitigation fund it ties right into that. Um, I, I would love to see eventually some sharing or some discount packages being offered because the price is offset by that tree mitigation fund, which makes it affordable and attainable to everyone with a yard. Um, the builders, every builder I've spoken to, they don't care what gets planted on those houses. They could not care less. Uh, so if it happens to be a native plant bundle of things that go in, they're going to shrug and just do it. I mean, they, they just, they want to sell the house. Uh, so they'll have some little landscaping up front that looks pretty typical, like they got it from Lowe's. And if there's a little strip in back that includes the three trees they have to plant and some native plants, they're okay with it. They're spending the money one way or the other. So we, the builders being on board is not a problem. They don't have a problem with it. That's really good. And, and you know, I'm imagining maybe at some point when this really catches on pushback from landscape companies that sell the generic non-native plants. I mean, there'll be something probably at some point in that regard, but who's to say you can't have a little bit of everything, put in your package, put in your certain plants, um, you know, plant it back. And then if you want to put other things in, go ahead. If we can get a um a setup with uh, any of the native plant nurseries or with Earth Balance that does huge commercial installations, they've got the resources to do it, where the packages are sold to either the city of Northport or to say your 501 or your nonprofit. Um, so they're available through this group. 
the landscaping companies can provide the labor and charge that and put them in. I mean, I don't want to block anybody out and hurt a local small business. They can do the installs. I'm not doing it. You know, there's only so much I can spend on my That's right. I don't want to do it either. I'm too old for that. So, <laughs> you know, we, we can work with the local landscaping companies, provide them with the packages. I don't, I don't want to keep it all under lock and key. I've got a full-time job. You've got a full-time job. I want the late, the local landscaping companies to say, hey, we can do that. Sure, do it by all means. Here's the planting plan. Go hog on it. You know, make a million dollars. I don't care. Put them in. And yes, that I, I love that uh, native plants. I think it was two per person they were doing or two trees. Love to see it. And I'm glad there was a line out the gate. That's fantastic. Um, it, it's heartening to know that the interest is there. They're not there waiting in line for a free sapling. They're there because it's a native plant. Um, which is why I think that this could pick up steam and we could do a lot of good things and, and help our little tortoise neighbors and the scrub jays and heck, uh, our hearts and souls. Right. That's right. As well as the native plants that are being scraped away and not planted back. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that whole other side concept too. So, all right. Well, so uh, Jennifer and I agreed prior to this that we were going to get together and, and go over all of what she just covered with with the plans that we have in mind and she initiated it all. And I can't thank you enough, Jennifer, for that. So um, stay tuned because we'll have more info rolling out on this plant package idea for builders and homeowners. Um, hopefully sooner than later, we've been trying to get it together for a while now, but uh, we're, we're getting there. The oh, she's link. putting in some uh, some links in the chat and David did too. So check the chat before you sign off. There's a couple of links in there. Yes, I just posted the page that has the, the spreadsheet link for the endangered species uh you can do searches on that now you can search for sarasota county you can search for charlotte county some of the plants however say central and south florida so there isn't a good way to sort that spreadsheet according to just what's applicable to us right here but with a little bit of creativity you can find what you're looking for on it and they do update update that periodically i think it was last updated in 2020. excellent all right, so there's no more questions. It's about eight o'clock, so uh, we will let everyone get back to their evening. Thank you, Jennifer. And sorry I to rush get this through recording it. Posted. I hope it was no, good. it was good. It was good. When you know, questions are important, and everybody you know has we hear about this all the time. So it's good to just have a place to talk about it. Yes, exactly. Thank you for joining all us. All right, appreciate. Thanks, it. everyone.